This is the 1982 National Farmers Organization Slaughter Cattle Meeting at Louisville, Kentucky. Slaughter Cattle Director, I'd like to welcome you all to our 1982 National Convention. Today, we're going to discuss some terms that you're familiar with and terms that uh, you may not be familiar with but you're sure going to recognize it when you see it. That would be collective bargaining, block sales, forward contracts, the habitual seller, kind of sounds dirty, doesn't it? The habitual seller. Well, you know, that individual is, and we'll be talking about it. And then liquidation selling. When I think of liquidation selling, the first thing I think about is a farmer being liquidated, a farm sale. And most farm sales today are forced sales. And we give the reason for poor crops or poor marketing conditions, total economically bad conditions. Well, that's true. But there's another factor in this. And that factor is liquidation selling. You see, every time a producer markets cattle independently or on his own, he liquidates himself a little bit at a time each time he sells independently. Today, I have with me Steve Demeray and Dwayne Wynn. Steve Demeray was born and raised in Rockford, Iowa. He's a relatively newcomer to the organization. But he's not a newcomer to the cattle industry. Steve worked for Wilson Foods and cattle procurement, and he worked it for Illini Beef out of Illinois. Steve today will be discussing block sales, forward contracts. He's going to talk about that liquidation sale and that habitual seller. For those of you that are from Montana, you'll recognize Steve, his voice anyway. You see, Steve has been putting his blocks of cows together for, uh, since early fall. He's been working on it for, I'd say, the last three months. And if you heard Walt in the general meeting yesterday mention that we've probably moved 500 times what we did last year, that's correct. And I have to give Steve all the credit for it, but we won't tell him. Steve? Thank you, Andy. <clears throat> I'd like to take this time to welcome you all to the 1982 National Farmers Convention. It's a real honor and a privilege to be here, to be part of a farm organization such, such as the National Farmers. In working for a packer for eight years, I was able to experience firsthand what liquidation selling and habitual selling really are and how it works. There's an old adage that a cattle buyer carries a gun. I never had to carry a gun. All I had to do was talk to those liquidation sellers and those habitual sellers. Liquidation selling, habitual selling, have a very devastating effect on the market today and in the past. We're going to take a look at habitual selling and the different types. The first type of liquidation selling I encountered in working for that packer and procurement 
was that producer who would call into the office and want to sell a load of cattle that morning because it was raining and he couldn't plant corn or he couldn't take his crops out. Or he heard on the radio there was a snowstorm coming. Okay, now can you hear me? All right. The second type of liquidation selling was that farmer who would call into the office and would want to sell a load of fat cattle for the next day's kill because he had a note due the following day at the bank. And the first thing that come to my mind that that producer was not a very good manager. You talk about being able to make money for a packer. The third type of liquidation selling is that producer who sells his entire production all at one time, once a year. I would go out to that producer's feedlot and walk through those cattle with that producer, and I'd start to cut those cattle down. I would say to that producer, you got a nice set of cattle here, but I see you got a couple stags. We'd walk a little farther, tell him how good a job he had done feeding those cattle, but you got an end of goods on those cattle, 15, 20%. There's a few lightweight cattle on them. He'd shake his head, yes. We'd start back towards the gate. I would again then tell him how good a job he had done on those cattle and that he had about 20% yield grade fours on him. He's shaking his head again. And by then, I'm able to purchase those cattle, possibly two to three dollars under that day's market. Talk about getting a bonus at the end of the year or a promotion. The fourth type of liquidation selling is that producer who will call into the office might not be able to see that. They were too close to the screen. Can you? Can't read it. All right, what Steve will be doing is he'll be, when he's mentioning this in his talk, that's all he'll be doing is mentioning what you see on the screen. We can't get it in. I tried all last night, but some some reason she just isn't coming in. But what you see on the screen Steve will be talking about. The fourth type of liquidation selling is that producer who will call that office in the morning and want to sell a load of cattle for the next day's kill because he's going to be out of feed tomorrow morning. And it comes back to me, that producer is a poor manager because he didn't plan farther ahead in his operation. The fifth type of liquidation selling are those National Farmers members that call into the home office at 11 o'clock in the morning or 2 o'clock in the afternoon and they want us to bargain a load of fat cattle for the next day's kill. Two days later, that producer will call back and ask the question, why did I not receive the top dollar for those cattle? And the reason why was because that negotiator in the office did not have those cattle on inventory to offer to a packer who needed them, possibly the week before, possibly at a two to three dollar advantage. In giving that negotiator, that home office, that inventory, they know which packers are needing which type of cattle, and they can do a better job of bargaining those cattle. <clears throat> The second type of selling I encountered was habitual selling. It was that young producer out there who would call into the office and sell a load of fat cattle simply because his father or his grandfather had sold there all their lives. That happens today, too. The second type of habitual selling is that producer who sells to that same packer or livestock market consistently on a given day each week or month. 
John Doe going to the Omaha market every Monday morning, or John Doe going to that local packer every Friday, no matter what the market was, just simply to get that weekend chill on those cattle, figuring they're going to grade better. The third type of habitual selling is that producer who sells to that same market consistently because he does not understand freight or shrink or marketing. And I've got a good example of that. Two weeks ago, a producer called into the office and asked what we were bidding on cattle and if we could sell his cattle. Well, the first thing I told that producer was, we do not bid on cattle, we do not sell cattle, but I will bargain those cattle for the top dollar that day. And that sounded good to him. He asked what we would be able to bargain those cattle for. I told that producer $96 on his steers, $93 on his heifers. Well, it sounds great. He asked where the cattle had to go to. I told him the cattle would have to go across state. Well, it's too far, too much shrink on the cattle, too much freight. I then asked him what his local packer only 40 miles away from him had bid him on those cattle. They'd bid him 92 on his steers, 89 on his heifers. $4 spread on that load of cattle. That producer then said, why are we in such a low priced market area? Why are we losing so much money? Well, I told that producer he asked to take the first step in trying to build a better marketing program. He has to experiment. He has to try moving those cattle out of that area. The fourth type of habitual selling is that producer who does not take the time to call a farm marketing organization such as the National Farmers. Those are just a few of the types of selling used today and in the past. Liquidation selling, habitual selling. They do have a devastating effect on the market, causing large market fluctuations in erratic markets. But the National Farmers has two options available to help eliminate that. <clears throat> Those two options being collective bargaining and block sales of fat cattle and forward contracting through the National Farmers. During the mid-1960s, we've seen a change in the cattle livestock feeding industry. That change in being large corporations, investment firms going into the southwestern part of the United States and building large feedlots. And why did those large corporations, investment firms go there? Was it the abundance of feed? We got the abundance of feed right here. <clears throat> Was it climate? Possible. Was it the volume possible? Let's take a look at a large feedlot in the southwest, a 50,000 head feedlot, for example, and then how they've developed a marketing structure. <clears throat> we have here a square which re represents that 50,000 head feedlot. And in that 50,000 head feedlot, it's divided up into four areas with a centralization point, with a feedlot manager, a cattle salesman. And in each one of those areas, there is a cattle manager. His job is the health, the taking care of the feeding of those cattle and talking into that centralization point, that feedlot manager, when those cattle are ready to go to market. That cattle manager then talks into that centralization point and is able to put on inventory with that feedlot manager out of area A 
400 steers that are going to weigh 1075 grade 75 percent choice. Or that cattle manager out of area B will talk into that centralization point. He will inventory 300 heifers weighing 950 pounds, grading 75 percent choice. Cattle manager out of area C and D will talk into that centralization point and inventory 500 steers weighing 1,100 pounds, grading 80 percent choice. In doing this, that gives that feedlot manager that volume, that inventory, the quality and the consistency needed to top that market, to develop that market structure. It was not the packers who brought the feedlots to the southwestern part of the United States. It was the feedlots who brought the packers to the southwest. And why? Because packers today operate on high volume, low margin kills. They, every packer today specializes in the type of cattle they kill. That 50,000 head feedlot have those types of cattle those packers need. And that is why they're there, why they'll give a premium for those cattle. Why are those large feedlots so successful today in getting larger and growing? Because of centralized selling. Let's take a look at a state. Could be any state. It could be Michigan, Iowa, Wisconsin, Kentucky. Within that state, we divide it up into four areas. In each area, we call that a block with that home office, that centralization point. In each block, we have a National Farmers Cattle Rep. That National Farmers Cattle Rep is then able to break his block down into counties and inventory those members' cattle. And in doing this, he can talk into that home office, that centralization point, and give the in inventory to those negotiators. That cattle rep can call into that home office out of block A or B and put on inventory 500 steers weighing 1,100 pounds, grading 80% choice. Or that cattle rep out of block C can talk into that home office and inventory 250 heifers weighing 950 pounds or out of block D. And in doing this, it gives that home office that inventory, that volume, that quality, that consistency they need to bargain with the packer. The packers will be very receptive because of that volume, that quality. The feedlots started this marketing structure of collective bargaining block sales in the mid-1960s. The National Farmers started collective bargaining in 1957. Those large corporations, those investment firms, seen the ideas and the methods and what the National Farmers built, and they utilized it to the full extent. We have it all right before us, what they got from the National Farmers and developed. There are several advantages to block sales of fat cattle. That first advantage to block sales of fat cattle through the national farmers gives that home office that inventory they need to bargain with because that packer, excuse me, that negotiator knows what type of cattle that packer needs and when that packer needs cattle. The second advantage to block sales of fat cattle is that it creates an orderly marketing situation. It eliminates those large market receipts two days a week, no cattle movement, the rest. 
The third advantage to block sales of fat cattle is that it will raise the market structure in a low-priced area. And how do you raise that market structure in that low-priced area? The fourth advantage, by moving that production out of that area if necessary. If that negoci negotiator is unable to bargain that block of fat cattle to that local packer. Those are just a few of the advantages to block sales of fat cattle. The National Farmers has a second option available also to help eliminate liquidation selling, habitual selling, and build a better market structure. That is forward contracting. Forward contracting is very advantageous to the market. The first advantage in using a forward contract through the National Farmers and a very important advantage today to stay in business is locking in cost of production or a profit. The second advantage is that bankers, ag lending institutes are more receptive to financing livestock feeding operations today and will be in the future with that producer using forward contracting. The third advantage to using forward contracting through the national farmers is that it takes the risk out of not knowing what you're going to receive for that product four months, six months, eight months down the road. The fourth advantage, and I'd like to add right now, the national farmers is the only farm marketing organization today that has this advantage. On each forward contract through the National Farmers, you receive a $1,000 advance payment on that forward contract. The fifth advantage to forward contracting through the National Farmers is that it eliminates that margin call or that speculating on the CME, the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. Those are just a few of the advantages to forward contracting through the national farmers. Let's take a look. I've got the specifications here for a forward contract through the national farmers. On a forward contract, it reads, you will deliver 40,000 pounds of fat cattle. The cattle will grade 80% USDA choice. You will have an allowance of 20% goods, 10% yield grade fours. The cattle will yield 62.5%. Weight, dressed weight ranges on steers and heifers on a forward contract is a six to eight hundred pound steer carcass, a five fifty to seven hundred pound heifer carcass. Spot delivery months available on a forward contract are December, February, April, June, August, October. Also optional are the middle months at an additional discount. The delivery period on a forward contract through the National Farmers is the first of the month to the 20th. If you have any questions on a forward contract, the specifications, feel free to call the home office to talk to either Andy or I on that forward contract and the specifications. I talked just a little bit earlier about the cost of production. I put some figures together. They're not accurate, but just to give you an example on how to figure cost of production or a profit. I took a 700 pound steer costing 63 cents. 
I come up with a first cost on that steer of $441. I then listed the vet cost per head. I grabbed the figure of $6.50. I then listed the depreciation on your feedlot and machinery. I used $3.50. I then went to the feed cost. I used $2.50 corn because it's loan value. I used $20 a ton corn silage. I come up with $155 feed cost on that steer. I then added the interest on the steer and the feed at 16%. I come up with $47.65. Total cost of production on that 1,100 pound steer was $653.65 with a break even price of $59.42. That is basically how you go about figuring cost of production or a profit. Feel free to call into the office if you need help on doing this. We've went over what habitual selling, liquidation selling really are, the effects they have on the market. We've talked about the two options available through the national farmers, collective bargaining and block sales of fat cattle and forward contracting through the national farmers. You, the livestock producer, are at those crossroads today. Will it be erratic markets, large market fluctuations, liquidation selling, habitual selling, or will it be the road to collective bargaining and block sales of fat cattle and forward contracting through the national farmers? Thank you. Thank you, Steve. I couldn't help notice when Steve mentioned the habitual seller and liquidation sales, the smiles that went across some of you folks' face. Had you ever thought of it that way? Have you ever thought of, well, I got a note due, I better get something sold? Uh, she's going to storm next week, I got to get these cattle out of here? It took a person like yourself to bring it to light to me. You see, I was born and raised in the packing house industry, and I thought all the time that habitual seller was a my customer. I didn't think of him anything else but my customer. And I knew those people that would sell time and time again to me. And basically, Steve's right. He was the one that was taken advantage of. Maybe sometimes down the line, if you needed cattle on a Monday morning and you knew you could get it for them, you might have given them a shot in the arm. Basically speaking, your habitual seller is one that's just going to be on that average market or less. The liquidation seller, he's absolutely in trouble. Our next speaker is Dwayne Wynn. Dwayne Wynn is from Woodhall, Illinois. He farms in that area. He's been a member of this organization probably as long as most people sitting here today. Certainly been affiliated with the organization a lot longer than I have. He's been a member for 21 years, over 21. He's been on the board of directors for over six years. And he's been employed by the Slaughter Cattle Division since 1976. Dwayne works in the western Illinois and the eastern Iowa area. 
and he is one of the area reps that uh, Steve pointed out in a transparency where he broke the state down. Some of our states don't have an area rep. Some have one, some have four. Dwayne works, as I said, as that re area rep in the western part of Illinois and the eastern Iowa area. Dwayne will be discussing collective bargaining through the collection points. He's going to give us a little history of the organization. <clears throat> and then he's going to tell us what needs to be done in the future. Duane? Thank you, Andy. Good to be here with you again today. Seems like at least once a year, you get to see some old familiar faces and a lot of new faces. And this I do enjoy. I've got three subjects that I want to discuss with you this morning. Where we started, where we are, and what we need to do. How many of you here this morning can remember back in the mid-1960s when we started marketing production through this organization? See your hands. I thought there'd be quite a few of you. It was in the mid-1960s. Down with lights, Mel, please. When we started out of the starting gates in this marketing game. We've come a long way. You have been and had many firsts in this marketing game. You were the first producer group to ever have a supply contract for production with a packer. You were the first producer group to ever have a representative in the packing plants. You know, when we first started discussing that with a packer, it was unheard of and they weren't about to start it. But they did, and they liked it because it gave them one person to deal with. It gave us credibility with that packer. You were the first producer group to ever have off-ball valuations in the contracts, supply contracts. Many firsts as we come down the line. But you know, we needed more options that we didn't have. We didn't have these options for the simple reason that we didn't have proper description of cattle in the country. You may remember I discussed with you last year that as I was a plant rep, I'd have cattle described to me. I'd go into the yards the next morning to find them, and I couldn't find them because they were described as 1,050-pound steers, all choice. And they might be eight to eight and a half when, I got, when they got there. We didn't do the job for the producer, and it sure didn't do the job for the packer. You don't have the options. It kind of comes like this, a little example. Any of you are familiar with the football game? You got them teams out on the gridiron, and the one team continues to hit the line and hit the line. Pretty soon the opposition is going to defense to it. And if you don't have that end run or that pass, what happens? You begin to lose a little ground, don't you? A 
That's what begins to happen. You fall behind a little bit in that marketing game, in the race. So we had to come with them options. The options I'm talking about that the industry was using was they were bidding in the flat beef price. They were able to come out and overshoot a little more than what some of the rest of them could on because of the off-all valuation. If we didn't have our formulations, if we were tied and didn't have a, a good formulation in there at the time. Some of the plants we didn't have an off-all formulation tied to. So as we come with the options, who were the men that we were going to put out here in the country? We looked at our plant reps. They were the most logical people for several reasons. Number one, they knew the producers. They'd handled their cattle. They had credibility with the packer. So instead of having that plant rep in the plants 100% of the time, we put him out in the country. We'd keep him in the plant maybe 10 to 15% of the time for spot checking, fulfilling the duties he needed. Now, I'm not talking about our high volume cow plants because there we need the man there 100% of the time and he still is. I'm talking where we're putting mostly fats in, load lot shipments and things like this. So as we brought that man out there, put him in the country, we had options that were available to us. The options that we're talking about that become available are these. Flatten the beef. Now, what am I talking about when I say flatten the beef? It's like this. I come out and I look at a set of cattle. They're like peas in a pod. There is an end of fours on them, and there's an end of goods on them. But there's one heck of a set of cattle. So why should we stand the grade? Why should we be discounted for the fours and goods? We price the cattle straight across. You pay, you're paid for the yield and not the grade. The next option that we'll come to is what I call the guaranteed beef price rail basis. So I go into another producer, ask him when he put the cattle in, how they've been fed. He tells me, gives me this information. The cattle are a little up and down cattle, not quite the quality that the last set were, that we're talking about. I feel the cattle will grade better than possibly what they're looking. But I'm also know that the time I can get the cattle into that plant, I feel this market's gonna be softer. So what I'm going to recommend to this producer is this. If we go ahead and we put the cattle in today at a guaranteed price, 95 for the choice, 93 for the goods, 86 for the fours, whatever it is, and deliver them at the end of the week. The next option we come to is what we call the grade and yield formula with formulation priced on day of kill. We still have this one available to us too. What I do at this time, Again, we've got this set of cattle here. They're a little up and down. I feel the cattle are gonna do better than what they look. To put the most dollars in that producer's pocket, I'm gonna recommend that we go ahead and rail the cattle. But again, I feel that by the end of the week this time, the market's gonna be a little bit stronger than where it is today. I also feel that that weekend chill on there is gonna give him a little better grade, so I'm gonna recommend that we kill them cattle on Friday and that we price them the day of kill. While I'm visiting with this producer, I look over into the other yard and I see he's got another yard of cattle over there. They're about six months down the road. Through the discussion, he tells me what he's paid for him. He tells me what it's gonna cost. 
put his gain on, and he figures he's got about a 30 buck ahead profit tied in today. Down the road six months, it don't look like that we'll have the market that he can get today on a forward contract. He's got two loads of cattle in his pen. I'm going to recommend to him that he forward contract one load. He ties that in. Takes his profit on half of them. If he wants to, he can play the other half. But he's got some of his costs guaranteed. Ladies and gentlemen, these are the options that we've been able to pick up, that we've been able to gain as we're coming down through the years. These options, as I said, we don't have in all areas, depending on, as Andy said, if we've got the reps in the areas or not. We've got some of them, but maybe not all of them that you come to. So this is successes that we've come with through our options. Andy told you I work in the western part of Illinois. We've had a packing plant back there in August. Used to be the one that Steve worked for. Then Dubuque bought it. Then all of a sudden they sold it one day. And they closed her down. The feeders in that area had had a market last week, but they sure didn't have one next week. Where do we go? Habitual sellers, where do we go? You look around, where they got? They got the sale barns or they got the terminal markets? It's about what's left. For the people that are with the National Farmers Program, they didn't have to worry about where they were going to go. Because I'd had an inventory of them cattle. And as I'd inventoried them cattle, I knew what they had, I could turn them in, which we did, I was a couple weeks ahead on them. I talked to Steve and Andy, let's find a home. This we did. I'll show you what happened, what took place. I talked about a terminal market and I used the Joliet market, Joliet, Illinois. Also, what I used on here was two days, Monday, November 8th, and Wednesday, November 10th. The reason I took them two market days was that the cattle that went through our program for the producers that I serviced, we killed them cattle on Tuesday, November 9th. I want to give you a fair comparison. As you see here, on Monday, November 8th, there was 2,600 head of cattle at the Joliet Yards. The steers, Choice and Prime, 11 to 1,250 pounds, sold from 58 to 58 and a quarter, with three loads at 58.75. The heifers that day, Choice and Prime, 9.75 and up, run from 57 to 57.50. If we go down to Wednesday on the 10th, they had 1,400 head of cattle at the Joliet Market. The steers, Choice and Prime, 11 to 1,250 pounds, a little stronger.